Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Great. So, uh, as Emily introduced us, we are from CDEX Smart Energy Design Assistance Center, and my name is Sumi, and this is Ryan. So, it'll be an hour-long presentation, and we may have some, you know, uh, time at the end for question and answer. But if you do have questions, just don't hesitate. Raise your hand and stop us. I think, you know, sometimes that works better than waiting uh, uh, to the last minute. So, how many of you have heard of CDEX, Smart Energy Design Assistance Center? Great, one, that's it? Oh, two, thanks. All right, so we are from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So we are a university organization, but we also you know, work with private partners. It's called the 360 Energy Group up in Chicago. So we are private part of a public partnership that is under the university. Very unique setting, so we do work with lots of public sector clients throughout Illinois, and our main, you know, uh, uh, work is like a public sector energy efficiency, but we uh, recently started working with state energy office. So I don't know if you are aware of. So Illinois State Energy Office used to be under DCEO, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, but that has changed. So current Illinois Energy Office is an Illinois EPA. So CDAC is working with Illinois EPA to provide energy uh, code training for everybody in Illinois. So our training is free to the Illinois people, contractors and engineers and code officials and architects. So uh, that's uh, who we are and that's what we do. So for our energy code training program, we're not just doing workshops, we do like this, but we have more than uh, in-person workshops. So we do have technical support line, like 800 phone number, and we also have a designated email address, which is energycode at cdec.org. So if any of you have questions regarding the energy code, you could always call us or email us, but I would say email is the best way because sometimes code related question gets a little hairy and we cannot give you the answer right away over the phone. So if you have questions, you know, don't hesitate to contact us through our email. And also we do have our website, it's called cdec.org and slash energy code and we have lots of information and you can find a link to other organizations or state information or the state adoption <coughs> process and things like that. And we provide webinars too and we just had our first webinar of this year, meaning that uh, this program year started in July. So we had one in residential <coughs> energy code and we plan to have at least four more in this program year. An upcoming webinar is January 16th and it's gonna be about commercial envelope. And I know you guys are lighting geeks, but uh, wait for the February one, we're gonna have a commercial lighting webinar. And for those webinars, we try to kind of marry with the uh, building code. So for lighting, we are uh, gonna add some, you know, mechanical, you know, code. Uh, in uh, addition to the IECC or ASHRAE. So if you're interested in, you know, sign up for our newsletter and then, you know, we can send you uh, how to register or you can just visit our website. And also we have online on demand uh, energy code training modules. What it is, we designed it so anybody could take it at any time at your convenience. So it's designed for hour or maybe hour and a half long for each modules and we have four modules developed so far one like uh, uh, residential and three in commercial envelope lighting HVAC so after those uh, you know uh, after you go through the modules there will be a quiz like a 10 questions if you pass you will get a certification congrats and if you don't, don't worry, there's a chance, there's no limit on how many retake you can take. So, you know, if you failed it, you can go back and try it again until you pass. So that's uh, the whole energy code training program. So not only just workshop, but more. So this is just to show you the look of our uh, the energy code training uh, 
program. So if you go to see that website, Energy Code Training is on the top right tab. So if you click, there are you know other sub menus under that. So I highly encourage you to visit our website to get familiar with Illinois Energy Code. So today's topic is about 2018 IECC lighting uh, specific and I want to just mention this website. This is the ICC website and I have the URL here but if you come to our website there's a link too. So what it is is you have a free access to 2018 ICC and also 2015 ICC too. So this is very handy if you want to search for certain, you have certain keywords that you want to look for the code because sometimes codebook it's hard to find where you can find that information. But this is very handy that you know what you're looking for and if you uh, put the you know, search word it will highlight and it will you know, send you to that location. One downside, you cannot print, you cannot you know, copy and paste, so it's for you know, copyright <coughs> protective. But I think it is very handy. So before we talk about actual you know, code requirement and stuff, we will spend a few slides, you know, we'll spend a few minutes to talk about a few slides. So this one is to just to show the history of model code. Model code being ASHRAE 90.1 and ICC. So in this graph, what it shows is top part is the residential, the red one. The bottom is a commercial. So model co code for this graph, this is done by, well, well, this is based on the data from DOE, but we created, there's other version of this similar you know, graph, but we thought this is easy to understand. So X axis is the time starting from 1975 to 2018, and then Y axis is from 0 to 100, 0 to 100 for residential, and commercial. To show you the revolution or you, you, the, how the model code has changed over the time in terms of energy consumption. So the, the way DOE analyzes the data is, okay, so let's say if we say 100 is the energy consumption, that if you build a building, residential and commercial, up to the code of 1975. Let's say that's our reference, that's 100. How did we do for the next code version? And what about next, next? So overall, it has reduced the energy consumption. That is a really good news. But only caveat is, you know, there are some big jumps here around 2012, you know, nine. But then since then, look at this from 2012 to, I mean, 15 to 18, teeny little bit for the uh, you know residential, and then you know a little bit more than more in commercial, but still it's not like a huge jump. So if you remember, you know 2030 promised that AIA kind of announced we are heading toward net zero, meaning that this will be zero in 2030. So we have very steep <laughs> curve to you know, follow. I think we can do it. Just it's, it looks a little challenging at this moment. So code is minimum. Just remember, it's not maximum. It's a minimum requirement. You can do always beyond code, you know, design and installation. So just remember, we have far away to go. So uh, mostly this presentation is about commercial lighting, but because we're all lighting geeks, maybe you guys want to know a little bit about residential lighting. It'll be just a couple of slides, because if you look at the code book, the residential section is small, and then the commercial is most of the books. So, so for the residential building, you need to look at the residential code, and the commercial building, you need, oh, residential provisions, and for the commercial building, you need to look at the commercial provisions. Sounds very clear and simple, but sometimes, it's not that simple, especially in Chicago. So well, I thought maybe it's a good kind of point to just go over quickly about what is residential building and what is commercial building. So residential building, according to IECC, <clears throat> is a detached one family or two family dwelling. 
excuse me. That's simple. Or any buildings three or less above grade <clears throat> that contains multiple dwelling units. In Chicago, it's three or less. Simple. I mean, four, sorry. <laughs> so in Chicago, it's four or less. Every, uh, everywhere else, it's a three or less. Simple. Commercial, definition of commercial, they didn't even bother to add the commercial that says anything not uh, residential, that's commercial. So the examples of the residential buildings are here. So a little quiz. So first one, the five-story mixed-use building with two stories of retail and three stories of apartment in Chicago. Is this commercial building or residential building? <laughs> residential. Everybody thinks it's residential? Most of them said commercial. Commercial. Oh, okay. I just picked the one that is residential because that was the wrong answer. I picked it up. All right. So it's uh, commercial because it's over three, you know, and four in Chicago. So second one, three-story mixed-use building with one story of retail and two-story of apartment in Bloomington. Is it a commercial building or residential building? Residential, because it's three or less in outside of Chicago. And the third, uh, third one, five-story single-family home. There's a millionaire who want to build a five-story single-family, go for it. Is it a residential building or a commercial building? So it's a little bit of a little bit of a trick there. <laughs> there is a divide. Good. Uh, it's residential because no matter what story, if it's a single family, then it is residential building. And then last one, too easy. Three-story hotel is a residential building or commercial building because it's not you know dwelling unit. You guys passed the test. All right, so a couple of slides for the uh, residential um, lighting requirements. First one, the change from 2015 to 2018 is the uh, percentage for the high efficacy lighting. It used to be 75%. Now it needs to be more than 90% of the uh, uh, permanent lighting should contain high efficacy lighting. So that's the change. So high efficacy lamp, what are those? So according to IECC, these are the definition, but there's a caveat in Illinois. So, well, let me backtrack a little bit. So uh, Illinois adopts, the Illinois is one of the states who adopt the most current uh, energy uh, model code, IECC in this case but they don't adopt it as a whole. They have their flavor, Illinois flavor. They have Illinois amendments. So there are a few you know, items that Illinois kind of change it. And uh, so far, the, all the proposals for the Illinois amendment has been reviewed and CDB and advisory council move forward with you know, their determination and they send it over to JCAR. So, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Secretary of State approved the change. So if things going well as it is, it seems like that's the amendment for the 2018 version of ICC in Illinois, which will be effective sometime in March 2019. So, so for, as I said, this is a definition of high efficacy lamps according to ICC, but Illinois said, hey, that's not good enough, so let's have our own definition. So this is, Illinois, according to Illinois, this is high efficacy and high efficiency lamps. <clears throat> so it's, you know, in terms of lamps, I think it's 65, which is higher, and fixture 55. But for most of, you know, like uh, LED fixtures these days, I think, you know, we wouldn't have problem of this amended requirement for the high efficacy or high efficiency lighting. So let's see, and then that's uh, the, that much up. The second one, so other, like uh, other, so 
R404 is under the residential provision. That's where they talk about electrical lighting. That's the main part, which is just like half a page. And other than R404, there are some lighting related requirements in residential provision. And one thing I want to mention is this. The recess lighting should be IC rate, uh, rated and labeled to have, air, have an air liquid less than two. CFM. And third one is what I like to emphasize. It needs to be sealed with a gasket or caulked between the housing and interior wall of the ceiling cover. So for the first one, yeah, it has, you know, some kind of mechanism gasket or trim that will fill between the housing and the fixture. So probably that's a good uh, uh, fixture. But second one, after installation, you see this gap. According to the energy code, this is not compliant because it's not sealed properly. So it's a small thing, but energy code talks about it because it's very important to have very tight envelope and we don't want lighting fixture to be a weak link there. And then now that's it for residential. So now we're going to talk about the commercial uh, lighting, which is C. That's why I highlighted or well, put the different color for commercial. So C405 is a section, major section that commercial provision talk about lighting. And there are mandatory provisions under C405. One being their general kind of, you know, definition type of thing. And the second one is lighting control. And the third one is exterior lighting power requirement. Those are the uh, mandatory, meaning no matter which path, you know, to be comply with the uh, energy code, you have uh, some options to go either prescriptive or performance, right? And yeah. But no matter which path, these are the requirements that you need to follow. One thing before we get too far away from residential that we should call out, in those high efficacy lamps and the 90% threshold, another big change that happened with 2018, low voltage lighting, is no longer exempt. So those, all these little MR16s now count in your, uh, in your lighting counts too uh, for residential. So that's a, that's a big change probably on the residential side that you will see. And the same goes to commercial too. Correct. The global. So for C405, which is a major section uh, under commercial provision for lighting, there are some highlights. So, so the way we're going to do it, I will just cover some highlights and big picture, and Ryan will come back, uh, come and then continue to talk about like a you know, section by section change. But I, before we go into the weeds, I thought it's useful to just think about a bigger picture. So, major highlights for the lighting section, you know, the LPD has reduced as we expected. It was going to go you know, down and down for the next code, code version too. So yes, it has reduced. And, and then there's a, a choice of luminaire level lighting control. So LLLC is a new term in energy code. And then uh, there's a more you know, mandatory control requirement. And then there's a requirement for auto, uh, interior automatic lighting shutoff. And there are some more language and manual override switch in daylight and special occasion. And there are some clarifi clarification language. So those are kind of highlights. And then other than 405, what other lighting related requirements that uh, you want to remember is that uh, so backtrack a little bit too. So to be comply with the Illinois Energy Code, you know, you as I say, you could uh, follow the prescriptive path or performance path. So to follow the prescriptive path, you need to meet all the prescriptive requirements, mm -hmm. and you need to pick one additional uh, high energy efficiency package, and out of so those are like a, a more enhanced HVAC you know uh, equipment more efficient and then 
uh, let's say, on-site supply of renewable energy, a dedicated outdoor air system, high efficiency, you know, water heating, and then high efficiency envelope, reduced air. So those are like a separate items that you need to pick in addition to all the prescriptive requirements. And there are two lighting-related efficiency like package. One is the uh, reduced lighting power. So if you I have chosen this one. If you save, more, if your LPD is less than 90 of what code required, you can say, hey, I meet this requirement, that additional efficiency package by doing this one. Or you could pick the second one, with, which is enhanced digital lighting control. If you have this and you say, hey, I'm following the performance path and this is my additional efficiency package. I have enhanced digital lighting control. So you could count as a additional efficiency package that I need to do if I follow the performance path. So the requirements for the enhanced digital lighting control is written here. You can, you know, read it and you can look at the code language. Uh, you I have guess. a question? Yes. Where do you identify that document? Okay. okay. Would it be on the comm check? <laughs> I'm not positive if it's on the comm check or not. It may just be a question that you'll have to note to your code official as part of the submission saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm following you know, whichever then, one, yeah. you know, you just call out. I'm going to use C, you know, 406.2 is my extra one. It, it does yes. need to be identified well, somewhere. Yeah. Whether it's in the comm check or somewhere else as part of your submittal. Mm -hmm. And then more uh, lighting related uh, highlights, uh, the changes, uh, the functional testing of lighting control. I think it was before, you know, the the requirement for the testing is, was there, but I just want to highlight it because this is something that could be overlooked and nobody could catch. There is not good mechanism to enforce it, especially for the documentation part. According to the Energy Code, a construction document you know, should include the drawings, which include the location and catalog number of each equipment, and, and also manuals and reports should be provided to the owner within the 90 days of certificate of occupancy. But uh, we've talked to code officials and they say, hey, once we issue the occupancy you know, uh, certificate, there's no good way for us to come back and kind of enforce this one. So I think it's heavily on you guys as a designer an engineer to try to follow this because you know you build and design a great lighting project but then if it was never communicated to the owner how to operate correctly you know not a good thing so I just wanted to make sure that you know we all kind of agree that this is a good idea and those are those are two important things is a make sure the systems work as we designed them we, we have done a lot of work to design these systems and A, make sure they work, and B, you know, making sure that the owners and, and particularly their maintenance staff, can they maintain it? You know, we want to make sure that we have a, an amazing building for years to come, not just, I turned you over, a, a, you know, here's the keys to a Mercedes, good luck. Uh, you know, making sure that we have done good training uh, up front and, and being able to provide that benefit to those owners for long term success of these projects mm -hmm. so we can come back you know after 30 years and the work that we have done hasn't had to be replaced so this is code minimum it's not anything you know fancy this is a minimum that we need to have just remember. so we're going to talk about some you know uh, item by item uh, and so as i mentioned before 405 c405 is a major section that talks about lighting so general, if you open up the code book or uh, open up the web page for the code, and the general, there are some uh, you know, guidance on what kind of requirements you need to follow for those uh, building types. So dwelling units within multifamily buildings, they say, oh, then you got to follow the R4041, 
which mean that you open up the commercial section, but they say, oh, if you have a dwelling unit within the commercial building, go back to our section. So open up the R section now for these spaces and uh, uh, you know, comply with R four hundred and one, which is what we uh, describe, uh, what we go, uh, went over is a high efficacy. Like you need to have at least ninety percent of high efficacy. All other dwelling units, you need to you have an option. You can first do the same thing, like a ninety percent of high efficacy, high efficiency lighting. Or you can uh, stay in the C section and do a specific application control uh, under that section C40524. There are some, you know, uh, applications, specific application which includes a dwelling unit. So you can follow that. And C40543, C4053, which is the LPD requirement. So you have an option. And in terms of lighting control, so you gotta have a lighting control. But good news, now you have a new option. So it wasn't here before in 2015 and 2018, there's an option to have LLC, luminary level lighting control. So you can go, you know, your you know, traditional lighting control that uh, needs to meet with all those code sections. Or you could do luminary le level lighting control. Doesn't mean that it's easier, it's just more option. So luminary light, uh, level lighting control should also have the uh, occupancy control, capable of occupancy control, and also the specific, you know, it needs to uh, comply with specific application control, and also the manual control. Uh, we will go over these sections in the later. But in the big picture, you have these two options. Either you go lighting control, the typical inner fixture and separate control, or you can have a control that is integrated in the luminaire, and those needs to follow these DCs section. So because it's a new thing, we want to spend a little bit more time. So luminaire lighting level control, you know, on top of those sections, the occupancy and you know those the manual control, you the LLC should also uh, be independently capable of these three things. One is occupancy control, which is kind of you know kind of similar thing, but you gotta have a, a, a capability in program two to dim or brighten per occupancy, and then. Daylight, you know, you gotta have, uh, gotta dim or brighten according to the available daylight. And then it should have a capability of uh, configuration and reconfiguration of the uh, luminary le level lighting control. Include dimming set point or timeout or wild, uh, and also wireless zoning should be capable of the luminary level lighting control. So, Occupant sensor controls. What are the new things? Not much in terms of the areas that it needs to have occupant sensor, but there's a one area that we want to uh, talk about, which is open plan office areas. That's a new thing. So before, open plan office area was not uh, under this requirement, but now it is. And then maybe one small thing is warehouse. Before it used to say just warehouse. Now they are saying warehouse storage area should have occupant sensing <clears throat> control. So if you uh, look at the code requirements for the occupant sensor, now they are specifically calling out for three uh, types. One for warehouse, one for open office, and third one is everything else. So for the warehouse, the lighting must, should, uh, should be uh, reduced by at least 50% when unoccupied. And what you need to remember is not just like one sensor control everything in the warehouse because that doesn't make sense. And it should be capable of and programmed to independently, you know, uh, control each aisle because, you know, if you have a high tall stack of you know stuff in the warehouse it doesn't make sense to turn on and off you know based on one sensor 
So it should be individually controlled and also mm -hmm. not only the aisle area, if there's like a general area in this picture like here, this should also be separately controlled. And then open office. So if you have an open plan office, which is larger than 300 square feet, you gotta have occupancy <coughs> control there. But you cannot have the zone greater than you know 600 square feet. You don't want to have a huge open office have one occupancy sensor control control everything, right? So they are, they say make sure that you kind of divvy up if you have a larger uh, open space office. And then the change in terms of time, I think 2015, it says within 30 minutes of occupancy living, you gotta turn it or dim it down, but now there's a 20 minutes. And then uh, uh, the lighting power uh, should be reduced by 80%. So this is different. Warehouse is at uh, 50, so open office, they give us a little bit more room, 80%. And then third one under occupancy sensor, warehouse, open uh, office, and then everything else. So same, 20 minutes, and then 50% power needs to be reduced. So uh, open plan office is only one that allows you to dim down to 80. But other than open uh, plan office, it should be dimmed down to at least 50%. And then that was the occupancy sensor control and time switch controls. So there are areas that listed under occupancy sensor <coughs> requirement. So if your area is not included in there, then you got to have a time switch control. And there are some exceptions for time switch control. And you can read it here. <coughs> And then what kind of function uh, time switch control should have? Like each space with timer or time switch control uh, shall uh, have a manual control for light, redu uh, light reduction. And there's a separate section for the manual switch requirement that we're gonna cover, uh, I think, next slide. And then the time switch control should have a minimum of seven day clock, capable of seven days. So, you know, just very reasonable requirement. Uh, day by day, Monday through Sunday, you should be able to uh, program and, you know, uh, uh, have a different schedule. And then holiday shut off, and you should, uh, well, the control should have a backup uh, capability for at least 10 hours if power disrupt. And then should have override switch because we don't want people to get in the dark when the time is out and you need to work more and you know, there's no way to override. That's not a good thing. So you gotta have an override switch. So light reduction control. So manual control. So there are many different ways to have a light reduction control, right? You can all dim, like the first one. <laughs> Or you can have, if the fixture have multiple lamps, you can, uh, or no, this one, if uh, you could have like a, you know, zigzag uh, alternating fixture or luminaire, so that way you can reduce by half or third or however, makes sense. And then if you, the fixture has multiple lamps, you could have one lamp and the other lamp uh, switched or dimmed separately. So however you want. Personally, dimming makes sense, so you don't have like a you know, spotty light distribution, but you have an option to meet this requirement <coughs> by doing alternate fixture or alternate lamp control. So daylight uh, control, this is where Ryan takes over. So any questions so far? All right. Yes. Uh, for light reduction control, mm -hmm. Um, how do you read how to apply it? Does it apply to all spaces, or does it only apply? To no, there's a requirement for a uh, light reduction control, and I need to go back to the code book and see which one needs to have light reduction control. Yeah, 
Now you're talking about lighting reduction controls as yeah. opposed to occupancy sensor so, controls. So I've heard, there have been a lot of interpretations of sure. it, a lot of discussions about it. So I read it that it's, a, it's pretty much required everywhere, that you have to have a manual control, and you also have to, on top of that, have occupancy sensor controls that are either vacancy or automatic on. So, Okay. I get into the debate sometimes. Yeah. Right, there, I see. There is a there is a specific set, uh, a specific section on uh, lighting reduction controls separate from occupancy sensor controls, and so it, it depends on where those two intersect. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a, a listing of all the occupancy sensor controls, but within these there are certain areas that further require you to be able to uh, reduce the lighting beyond, have a manual control or a manual, yeah, a manual override to be able to turn the lights off uh, further than that. So there is some intersection, but it's not complete overlap. So, and I, and I know it's a little confusing, uh, some of the phrasing on this, in that uh, particularly in uh, lighting reduction, is they talk about the minimum that it must reduce. So several of those, it talks about 50% or 80%. That's how much you have to reduce it, a, a minimum of that much. So uh, you know, in the case of a minimum reduction of 80%, that means you have a maximum remaining of only 20%. Zero percent remaining is less, yes. <laughs> Uh, I have a question on open office. Sure. On open office, you're required to break it into zones of control of 600 square feet or less. Yes. So that's 20 feet by 30 feet. If you do sensors, you're required to do sensors in the open office now. Are they required to be vacancy sensors, manual on, or can they be auto on? I would have to confirm that. Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to you sensors, you're going to have to put a lot of switches all over a large open office area. Yeah, and that's where I'd have to double check. Uh, open offices probably are occupancy sensors, they're not vacancy sensors, but in most areas they do require vacancy sensors. So the problem is they don't give you that exception, they give you an exception for hallways, restrooms, etc. Yeah. But not on the open office. Okay. I think that I got that check. I'll, I'll have to double check that, but that yeah, that that could be <laughs> the other one I have that would be a problem. I could see you have a list there of the, the areas and one is locker rooms. Mm -hmm. Locker rooms is not listed under exception for being manual on. <clears throat> Every school that I do wants those locker rooms out of on. They do not want manual on. They think of it as a huge safety issue. <clears throat> yeah. So. Yeah, and, and that's where some of these you, you may end up. Uh, one, one nice thing about the, the uh, International Energy Code is it does give more flexibility to the uh, authority having jurisdiction for certain applications like that where you can walk in and, you know, make the case to them that this is, I appreciate that this is what the code says, but from a logic standpoint, this does not work in this application. Uh, and that's generally we, we find code officials to be somewhat reasonable. <laughs> you know, not that they're going to let you get away with everything, but in certain applications where, you know, a locker room where you have, you know, a large open area, you know, a manual on doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, so being able to identify and call out, uh, we haven't gotten into a lot of questions about that, and so that's why I'm hesitant to answer some of these specific questions. Because that's something, anytime you, you guys uh, email us questions, whether it's you guys, we're happy to talk with you know, designers, building owners, code officials, you know, homeowners, we're, we're happy to, to provide information and technical assistance to. Uh, but that's part of the reason why we recommend email is because the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull out our code book and figure out what does it actually say. 
Sometimes that's not what we want it to say. But, you know, the, the code is what it is. Uh, so if we get into some of those, you know, and that's part of something else that code officials generally uh, do appreciate is because we're here to serve the entire state. And so they may ask you to, to approach us and say, hey, can you get some, some interpretations or, or, you know, provide some, some evidence and feedback about, you know, because since we do serve the whole state of Illinois, they like that we are able to provide a more consistent answer and basis. Uh, so it's not just their personal interpretation, but what have we done across the state? But then again, code official has a final say. Right. You know, we are here sense. to provide a guidance and you know our best, you know, reasonable answer. But our answer is not, you know, cannot be holden to the court. So your code official is the one. And also, I want to mention, you know, changes in 2019. There are some language changes. And if you look at the definition section, approved used to be like it's tested and according to this testing procedure and blah 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 and by code of but they had changed to 2018 ICC approved by code official. So if your code official says fine, then that is fine for that project. So that's what I want to get. <clears throat> As we transition over to uh, daylighting controls, I generally prefer to call out the exception first because I find it's a little easier and that there is a, a provision within the code that if you are able to reduce your lighting, total connected lighting power by 40% of the day lit zone, you don't need daylighting controls anywhere. So, uh, Sure, and, and we'll go through a we'll go through a, a, an example or two. So if you take your total connected lighting power density available, your total budget, and you reduce the daylit the portion that is in the daylit zone by forty percent, and that's your new budget. As long as the total building is under that budget, you're done with daylighting controls. You don't need them. So that's a good way to simplify, because if you don't have to buy the controls and install the controls for daylight harvesting, you don't have to commission the controls either. So that can be a lot of expense that you can save just by doing a little bit better design. Uh, so it is required in spaces that have over 150 watts within the daylight zone. Uh, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but 150 watts is not a whole lot. You're talking probably three, maybe four fixtures in the daylight zone will not trigger daylight controls unless you use the exception. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions as far as uh, places that those controls are not required. Uh, healthcare, uh, Specialized application controls, uh, as called out, uh, and then uh, a couple of specific group uh, occupancies. So, what is total connected lighting power? So, that's going to be nameplate, wattage of incandescent fixtures, transformers for low voltage, uh, LEDs, uh, track lighting. Uh, is 8 watts per linear foot or the total connected power of the fixtures on that track. Uh, that's a big reduction. It used to be 30 watts per foot minimum. So that dropped to 8 watts. Part of that is with LEDs. If you pack 30 watts per foot, you're going to have one bright spot. Uh, so, so that's just trying to get what is my total power. Uh, the adjustment, here's where we talk about this 40%, and it's a weighted area of your building. So it's the weighted area of the daylight zone times 40% and subtracted from your total uh, budget. So here's a, here's a couple of examples here. 
So if we start with a 200,000 square foot office, we're going to assume half of it is in the bay lit zone. Our initial budget for an office is 0.79 watts per square foot. So that gives me a total power allowance of 158,000. Let's say, okay, now I subtract off 40% of the weighted average area of the building gives me 126,400. So if my building is below 126,400 watts of connected lighting power, I'm done with daylighting controls. I don't need them. If I'm above that threshold, I need daylighting controls. So that's a 20% reduction because my square footage was half. So 40% of 50%. So. <clears throat> Similarly, if I drop to 50,000 square foot of daylight area, I only need a 10% savings in the total power. Now you can save this connected wattage anywhere in the building. It doesn't just have to be strictly in the daylight zone. So if you reduce the, the lighting power across the whole building by, uh, in this case, 10% or 20%, that's fine. Any suspicions as to why they count 40%? How they came up with this 40% no. How much do we put daylight in control space? So if I reduce the total connected power by that much, I've saved the same amount anyway. So this talks about the uh, control functions. Top lit, so this is skylights, uh, clear stories, uh, roof monitors and the like, they have to be controlled independent from the side lit window zones. Uh, and you have to be able to calibrate the sensors from within the space. Now that doesn't necessarily mean the remote control must be in the space, but you have to be able to calibrate them while you're standing there. And the calibration mechanism must be readily accessible. So there is a, a little bit of uh, provisions as far as requirements for continuous dimming uh, versus step dimming. With LEDs, I think that has made dimming a whole lot easier as compared with the fluorescent dimming. Uh, and obviously in, in daylighting, we can obviously have enough daylight that we don't need any artificial lighting, uh, which is why it has to be able to be able to completely turn them off. Silent zones in different cardinal directions have to be controlled independent. Now you do, uh, there is an allowance for 150 watts that can be controlled if it falls in both uh, cardinal directions. Uh, obviously the north exposure is going to have a very different uh, lighting profile from the western or eastern exposure. But in those corner areas, the other can overlap and so they provide some provisions for that. How do we know where the, the zones are? Uh, these are diagrams taken directly out of, uh, out of the code book. Uh, and so we take the height, the head height of the window <coughs> from the floor to the top of the window, and we flop it in. And then you get the width of the window plus two feet on either, on either side. So that's how you end up with this box. Now, there are a couple of uh, things for small uh, small windows. It's got to be at least 24 square feet before it counts as vertical fenestration. You know, when you have a small little bathroom window, we're not going to count that. This is what it looks like on drawings. You need to shade it, and it does need to be called out. Something that can help code officials is if you're going to uh, Basically, to put the uh, wattage that's in the daylight zone, you know, here's my total wattage, here's my total in the daylight zone. If you put that right on the front page of the, or one of the, uh, one of the forward pages on the drawing, 
That makes it a lot quicker for your code official to find, check, move the plans along. But yeah, calling this out makes it a lot easier. And here you can see I got some windows, flops in, and a little bit on either side of the window. Top lid, very similar, uh, but here it goes 70% of the total height from the monitor to the <coughs> Getting into specific application controls. So this is where you end up where you've got occupancy sensor or time switch and manual control. So display and access areas, <coughs> display cases, supplemental task lighting, uh, and sales lighting. You know, these are areas where you don't need it all the time, particularly when the cleaning crew comes through. They don't need the sales lighting on. And that's kind of where why they've done this is you control it separately because it's not your normal general area lighting. Uh, sleeping units. Uh, here they talk about there is uh, this is automatically controlled occupancy sensor. Uh, Twenty minutes again. Now they do allow for key card uh, control switches. Any of you stayed in hotels with these yet? A couple. So these are these are kind of newer. Like them? Don't like them? Any? You just need two room cards. Yeah. 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 That's part of the challenge with some of these is they're easy to de easy to defeat. Uh, dwelling unit. Uh, again, going back, occupancy sensors or lighting reduction. Controls, and then obviously, if you have lighting for plants or uh, heating, food warming, different controls for that, independent of the general lighting. Here's where we get into some manual controls. Occupancy, or occupants need to have ready access to these. If I need to turn a light off, I should be able to get to it to turn it off. That is the biggest problem I, I faced with one building that they put in. They put occupancy sensors everywhere, and they didn't put any light switches in. So now you have <coughs> conference rooms where people try to do presentations, and they have no ability to turn the lights off so you can see the screen. So, uh, and should be located either where the fixtures are visible, or these would need to be labeled as far as what they go to, so you know when you Turn the light off when you turn it off on. Uh, exterior lighting. This is some of the, the newer stuff. It is decorative lighting, is facade uh, and landscape lighting. So, and they need to be controlled separate from your normal uh, general lighting. This decorative lighting, within one hour of business, needs to be turned off. Uh, this is something that may be coming as more of a zoning requirement in the future. Where right now it's for new construction only. But we are seeing more and more cities adding this to the zoning requirements to say, if a new business moves in, they have to do this. But why should the existing businesses not follow suit? And this one hour, that lets people go home. Uh, and this is just your decorative lighting. So it's your, your building facade, your landscape lighting. This is not parking lot lighting or anything like that. Uh, now lighting setback, which would count for your parking lots, 30% minimum reduction. Uh, and that's either from uh, midnight to 6 a.m. You see that reduction, or again, that one hour before business. Now that could be 30% dimming, that could be you turn off certain lights and leave others on, so the ones more remote I'll turn off, the ones closer in I'll leave on. Uh, more occupancy sensor controls for parking lots. We're starting to see some of that, but I think that's why those technology is, it, it gets a little hairy because of the span that they need to cover. Uh, interior lighting. So, building area method, uh, 
uh, or space by space. This is got a continuation of from four. These power densities have uh, decreased slightly. Uh, now there are several exclusions here. You know, TV broadcast, exit size, so on and so forth. Lighting for theatrical purposes. You know, photographic, TV uh, uh, advertising or directional signage is excluded. But most everything else counts. <coughs> So this gives you a, a sense as far as how the, the reduction has gone. It's been a much more modest reduction, uh, with the exception of libraries. Libraries had a substantial change uh, from 2015 to 2018. But you can see kind of modest here. Called out libraries, this is a big one. It's gone from almost 1.2 to under 0.8. And I think part of this is because you look at a modern library, it kind of reminds you of an office. And so they looked at it and said, well, we're gonna use more of an office level for it. Not exactly ideal, but that's kind of the way it went. So, 2015 went from 238,000 watts of available, of a budget down to 156,000 for 2018. So that's quite a difference. 82,000 watts difference. So if I'm using 277 volt lighting, now grant this is a fairly sizable library, 200,000 square feet. That's almost 300 amps of 277 volt lighting gone. The budget's been reduced. And if I take that and convert that to how much air conditioning do I no longer have to buy? About 23 tons of air conditioning I don't have anymore. So that's that's quite a bit. So libraries were the, big, the biggest change. Uh, everything else is more of a moderate change. If you need more flexibility, they can give you the space by space uh, option where they break everything down into more bite sized pieces. Uh, so, as you can see, healthcare, you know, rather than just hospital, doctor's office. This it breaks it into a whole bunch of different little bits and pieces for you. So, healthcare clinic otherwise is 0.82. And a hospital is uh, 1.05 watts per square foot. So these tend to be a little bit more generous than the building area method, but that depends on your mix. Plus, this takes a lot more time to do. Then you also have for sales, there's a, a little bit of a provision for that as far as additional allowance to be beyond the budget, this cannot be traded with your general lighting. This is specific for the application. So. So. Here we go back. Uh, and again, here, IECC has eight watts per foot now. ASHRAE 90.1 is still at 30 watts per foot. So this, that's another big change between those two. As compared to the National Electric Code that has 75 watts per foot. So, exterior lighting, there's a bunch of exceptions for that. Obviously, athletic fields and the like, the amusement parks. Notice lighting that is approved because of safety considerations. Going back to that definition of approved, code official. They get to make the call, is this approved, is it not? So again, this is getting in that nitty gritty of, I need just a couple of extra watts. Uh, you might be able to, to get that. Exterior lighting, they talk about the four zones, uh, as far as what your, your power for exterior lighting. Most people probably don't deal with zone number one. And zone number four, for the state of Illinois, is only found in Chicago. 
and then only the high activity commercial area of the city. So it's by the land planning authority that designates that specific area. So most everything you're going to find is two or three. So, this is another table out of the book as far as various areas. Uh, and you can see as you go into more metropolitan, the number goes up. And as you get out in the parks region, we want to relive. Uh, this is something that there was a, an amendment made. Or so that's not an amendment. Okay, so if you have a paper copy of the code book, this section has some typos. For instance, like entry canopy is in zone one, it says you know point two. That's the correct number. But if you open up the paper copy, it says zero point zero two. So they missed the by you know the decimal point. So that's a you know their error. So next you know probably addition they will fix it, but the one that they already published. That they've, they've fixed it in the second printing, so that's something to be aware of. There's about four, uh, four <coughs> items that in the first printing they have a typo, so they've fixed it in the second printing of it. But something to be aware of. Uh, and I think there's four published errata where they've fixed it since then. But yeah, yeah, there was an extra zero in there. So yeah, point zero two. That's a that's almost nothing. So, uh, entry canopies. It's a building facade, and then ATM and bank depository. We'll do a quick little, uh, quick little thing here. As far as what our budget is for here, for total lots here. So I've got one ATM and two drive-up lanes. So I get 135 plus two times 200. So that's 535 watts that I have available for this area. So we don't talk too much about 90.1. How many of you deal with many projects that use 90.1? A little, a little, a couple. Uh, this was predominantly used for state buildings where it was required. Another change for 2018, state buildings will now be allowed to use IECC. They are no longer required to use 90.1. Uh, predominantly where we see this used is semi-heated buildings uh, in the private sector. And that's because IECC doesn't have that classification. Yeah. But two reasons that we typically see that people don't use it, automatic receptacle controls, and electrical <laughs> energy monitoring requirements. Uh, so yeah, semi-heated uh, or special request. Uh, that's another thing he is. The new ASHRAE allows uh, Appendix, I want to say G, uh, for compliance. Previously that was not allowed, uh, but they have now added that for the 2016 version, which is allowed to be used for the 2018 code cycle. Automatic receptacle controls at least half have to be controlled. Uh, and that can either be scheduled, occupancy sensor, or automatic control system. Problem with occupancy sensor that we have found is particularly when you're dealing in a school with a computer lab. And occupancy sensors that have not been properly commissioned, that don't pick up typing. And so the students aren't moving around enough, and all of a sudden half the computer's turned off. So but must be permanently marked to differentiate. Here's some examples of how that is. Uh, this one, both of them are controlled. That says this one, this one, the top one is controlled, the bottom one is not. Not an inexpensive item. Uh, this is one that I look at and say, you know, we talk about the key cards being easy to defeat. How many see, how many see a power strip over the end yeah. here? <laughs> and that, that's one that I look at. This is this is a, a code rule that I look at. That's like, yes, yeah, in there. This is this is probably not an, an ideal thing. However, electrical energy monitoring, ASHRAE ninety point one requires these loads to be monitored. From a building owner perspective, this actually makes a lot of sense to do. 
because if I can see, you know, hey, I've got load during the during the day in my exterior lighting, I need to go find something. Or, hey, my receptacle circuits, I got a lot of load overnight. Okay, who's not turning stuff off? Or do I have a lighting control system fault out? So from a troubleshooting standpoint, I like this. You know, might not be a bad uh, bad thing to, to consider. But yeah, required for 91.1, not required for ICC. But I, I do like the, the concept behind this. Recorded every 15 minutes for at least 36 months. Metering has gotten very cheap. Uh, you can now get a meter with four CTs for 500 bucks. It runs on a pair of AAA batteries that last for 16 months. And the thing holds five years worth of data. Not, not bad to do. All right. Sorry, I know we went a little bit over. Uh, but if anyone does have questions, uh, we will stick around for those. Feel free to, to email us. And I will note if you email us, please let us know if you're talking about residential or commercial. Because I run into that frequently where I'll get a description of a problem, but they can't tell me which section of the book I need to start need to start with. I may end up in the other section, but at least I need to start from one side of the other. All right, thank you all thank for you very much. Thank you so much.